Welcome to the MCC's 25th Anniversary Commemoration Special. For the upholding, preservation, and dissemination of the faith, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad rasulillah, and the principles and practices of the religion of Islam, we, the Muslims of Greater Chicago, do hereby establish this organization. In the mid-60s, very few Muslims populated the city of Chicago. At that time, four main Muslim centers existed. The Islamic Cultural Center of Chicago on LaSalle, the Arab Cultural Center on 79th Street, the Turkish Club on the west side, and the Bosnian Religious and Cultural Home on 1800 North Halstead. At the same time, there started to be a large influx of young Indian and Pakistani professionals who had left their homelands in years past and started to settle with their families in Chicago. Many of these recent graduates held on to their college roots by working with the Muslim Students Association at the Illinois Institute of Technology on the south side. We came as a students, we were on the campuses, and then we came to the cities for the job after our education, and we used the campuses, the Muslim student organization, uh, and we joined them even though we no longer were a student, but uh, facilities were there. While some of the young Muslims in Chicago stayed in and around the MSA at IIT, others ventured and built a relationship with the Bosnian Religious and Cultural Center on 1800 North Halstead. We used to go to Bosnia 
mosque on uh, 1800 uh, Halstead Street. And that was the only mosque in the whole city of Chicago at that time. This is where we used to take our children to the Sunday school and we met several other people. Most of the people there were from Bosnia. Uh, I met uh, Abdul Hamid Dogar, who was the only other uh, Pakistani at the time going to that center, and Muslim Qureshi. Except for a handful of people, the relationship between the two groups was not very extensive. There were some uh, uh, cultural differences too with our Indo-Pakistan. They, they were a little reluctant. They preferred to meet there at IIT rather than come here, but some people used to come there also, but once in a while, not regularly. Despite the fact that the two groups had not totally assimilated, the Bosnian center continued to grow, and those within it realized that there was a definite need to establish a masjid for the growing population of Muslims in Chicago. Uh, actually, uh, when more, more people started coming, the facilities we felt were not enough and we should have a new place. So at that time, then we realized that we sh uh, Chicago must should have a masjid built and an effort was being made by the imam of the Islamic Cultural Association. The discussions, initial discussions, they were just uh, on this, that we have to have something for the Muslims. So if all the communities, all the ethnic groups, they join, so there will be strength, and it is, uh, eventually it is going to be a better organization established on sound footing. Initial fundraising efforts were started. However, disagreements soon came up over the name and focus of the new center. The name used to be Muslim Religious and Cultural Home, and they told that we want to change it to Bosna American Cultural Center. And then at that time, I talked on phone to the imam that uh, why do you want to change it? Because uh, this is a good name, already Muslim name, and you want to make a Bosnia, nobody will know if it's Islamic or not. And he said, uh, no, the, th the reason is that uh, because of being the Muslims, we are being persecuted by the city. They gave a lot of citations to us that this is wrong, but we are building this around building. And we feel this is due to the fact that we are Muslim. Plus, we want to serve the Bosnia, our people, back home, and uh, we want to change the name. The Bosnians did their fundraising and moved out of Chicago, where they eventually built a masjid in Northbrook. The founding members got back together to continue discussions about how to build a mosque for the city of Chicago and determine whether or not they should build a community among themselves or still pursue relationships with Muslims of other ethnicities. So I remember distinctly we had uh, uh, two or three people uh, who were the leaders in the community at that time, some of them still are, uh, Dr. Abdul Hamid uh, Wahid Fakhri and Abdul Majid. And I remember distinctly there were these two gentlemen sitting uh, across from me, and uh, we were myself, uh, Mohsin Qureshi, and uh, Abdul Hamid Dogar on one side, and uh, Abdul Majid and Dr. Fakhri across from us. And uh, so after we described what our thoughts were, uh, Dr. Fakhri raised the question. His question was, he said, you know, you're trying to form an organization, uh, basically a, a Muslim from India and Pakistan, isn't this against the concept of Ummah. So the efforts were made to bring in the Turk, uh, Turks, but somehow or other there was some uh, conflict in the very idea of having a cultural center or a uh, Islamic center. That's why they could not join. Also they had some money and they had their own plans. So the second effort which was made, that was with the Arabs. And they told us that uh, you people from Indo-Pakistan are very orthodox and uh, we are not, we are modern thinking and we might have, we might have their uh, movies or uh, dancing in the building and you will not like it. And I told them that, uh, well, you can have separate that one for your cultural things and uh, the Islamic activity, we should have one place, we should have all Islamic center jointly together because at that time I thought we are not many people here and uh, we should all work together if we start, start separately, our resources will be divided. Plus, my feeling from the very beginning was that we are Muslims. And no matter from which country we are, we should stay together. So these were the two major, major efforts. As far as the effort with the uh, black American Muslims are concerned, uh, no effort was made. At that time, there was a very good uh, uh, <coughs> hold of Ali Jah Muhammad on the black Muslims. They could not join other organizations. 
So that was the reason that we did not approach them. As a result, the founding members got back together and decided to build their own community center using the resources of a rapidly expanding Indian and Pakistani immigrant base in Chicago. As we grew, then we felt that we have enough resources right in our own community that we could do it on our own. And that's the reason why we went, the Indians and Pakistanis and the Asians went separately and we did our own MCC. The MCC was officially incorporated as a general not-for-profit corporation on September 18, 1969. Its original address was 55 Jeffrey Lane in Des Plaines, Illinois, the home of Brother Mohsen Qureshi. The first business meeting of the MCC was held on January 24, 1970. The board included seven members, from which a president, vice president, secretary, and treasurer were elected. The original board included Wahid Fakhri, Hamid Dogar, Afsar Ali Khan, Naeem Sharif, Mohsen Qureshi, Sayyid Majid, and Ashraf Ali. In the early years, the basic objective of the MCC was to carry on religious, charitable, and educational activities that conformed to the religion of Islam. In order to help achieve these objectives and build a strong membership base, the MCC held a number of get-togethers at the International House on the University of Chicago campus during the calendar year of 1970. Fees for the dinners were only $1.50 per person, and while the adults socialized and laid plans for the future, the children were treated to such classic movie hits as Taffy the Jungle Hunter, A Thousand and One Arabian Nights, and Nikki, Wild Dog of the North. The first year's efforts were not without results. Membership grew from eight members in January of 1970 to 100 members by January 1971. In addition, by the end of the first year, the MCC had received over $34,000 in pledges to help build the masjid the community so sincerely desired. The people were uh, very anxious. They, were, uh, they wanted a place to get together. They wanted a place to have a school. They wanted to have a place where they can go and uh, meet the other people. There were very few members at that time and uh, it was more a get-together and socializing. That was the only way that we could impart our back-home culture to our children, is by getting together and holding these parties and uh, birthdays and anniversaries and all those kind of events. Atmosphere, there was a lot of atmosphere in these first meetings, dinners, uh, which were for the creation of some kind of organization. I would say it's one with one word, enthusiasm. Everyone was concerned, everyone was uh, uh, kind of excited, and everyone was, was thinking about uh, uh, future. By 1972, the MCC had raised $40,000 in cash and begun searching for a building which could serve as a community center. They found a building that was owned by the Danish community and located on the north side of Chicago at 1651 North Kedzie. Muhammad Ali Yusuf led the negotiations for the building, which was purchased for $60,000. The MCC took possession of the property on September 21st, 1972. Then we, we took possession, we talked to the seller, and we said that if we pay the $20,000 after one year, and he, he said, no, then you have to pay interest. I said, uh, how much time you can give us without paying the money, without interest? They said, we give you 90 days. Then when we held the fundraising dinner, um, we raised $24,000 instead of $20,000, and we were able to collect that money. It is said, if you build it, they will come. In the case of the Kedzie building, that held true. Once a central location for Muslims in Chicago was established, people from all over the city started coming to the Kedzie building on Sunday mornings. Oh, at that time, people were very excited. And uh, although not many people were participating before that in the fundraising dinner or other, but once achieved, we got the building, a lot of people showed up. I, I was surprised how many people, the Muslims were there. Almost immediately, the MCC established a Sunday school for the children. Educating the youth, of course, was the top priority. And one of the things we also have started was, I think MCC is unique in this sense, probably, that uh, Sunday school, all of our children, we have layperson. We didn't have the alims and uh, malvis and other people uh, hired to teach these children. 
we decided that the parents and the people from the community resources, they are going to teach Islamic values to our own children. For the students and teachers alike, Sunday school in the early 70s was a memorable experience. The classes were very small and contained a family-like atmosphere. In the Kedzi Masjid, I think there were around 10 or 11 kids altogether, about five guys and six girls. And uh, we were around nine or 10 years of age when we first started in the first MCC class. We had very good um, kind of a personal relationship with the families. We were just about 50 families at the time. And um, uh, the brother Azmatullah Qadri and um, I remember Abdul Samad Patel and other brothers uh, who were teaching there. And also we would have social gatherings as well. Uh, it was a very interesting uh, beginning. Everybody knew each other. The late Dr. G. Munir Ahmad was the first principal of the MCC Sunday School. A well-known scholar, he dedicated the last years of his life to helping educate the Muslim youth of Chicago and develop a curriculum for the Sunday School. Dr. Munir was a very humble and very polite type of person. A great person, intellectual, thinker, and highly respected and very pr good practicing Muslim. We have a lot of regard for uh, him. One thing they were th th that can be attributed to his efforts was his uh, uh, being an educator. So he developed the first curriculum uh, for the weekend school. And I think uh, in the whole of the United States, there were not that many centers as we have now, of course. But uh, that was the first organized, bound curriculum for the weekend school. And this was his, his contribution which led the way to other centers later on to use that as an example uh, to develop their curriculum. As the community grew and membership at the MCC increased, the center underwent many organizational changes during 1973, 74, and 75. In 1973, the dominant structural question in board meetings was whether or not the MCC should be governed by a permanent board of trustees or should it remain a membership-based organization. Those who favored the trustee system did so because they wanted to ensure the financial stability of the organization, as well as ensure that the center remained a strictly religious place and did not turn into a cultural center as it happened with other Muslim organizations in Chicago. So for that reason, they thought a small group of those people who were committed should be the board of trustees and they should control it and not leave it open. This was discussed in a, in a committee uh, for a year or so, and, and the other point of view then came in that the, the, the masses were the people who had contributed, and it is for them, and they will be the users, and um, they, if you keep them out, you will not attract the masses to the center, and that's the whole purpose of the organization. So the thinking was that no matter what, the, the supreme power must rest with this community represented through the common members, which is called the general body, Ultimately, the membership-based system won over, and as a result, the MCC's dependency shifted to one of an organization whose lifeblood would be dependent on keeping and maintaining an active membership. At that time, many of us had the sense of mission that uh, after the Prophet uh, there is no prophet, and it is the community which performed that role of the prophethood. And it is the whole community which is given the responsibility. And how the community should project its execution or work by electing its own leadership. So the community, total community gets involved in this process if they elect their own leaders. So leaders and the community becomes one body and the whole community is performing its mission. Once the general philosophy of the organization had been established, the members then set out to build the structure of the organization. In 1974, a number of functional committees were formed. The committees varied in scope and nature and were based on the model used by the Muslim Students Association. The advantage of that model was very apparent too because that allowed a lot of people to get involved. The whole purpose was that the community has several facets of work. It's not only praying, community services, education, dawah, many types of activities, and you need a lot of volunteers to, to work. And, and the best structure that worked for us in MSA, and which we found that also working in the MCC, was to have a large number of functional committees. 
With the emphasis of change in place, the MCC established a new constitution in 1977. The new constitution expanded the board from seven members to 21, made provisions for over 20 functional committees, and most importantly, called for the president to be elected directly from the general body instead of being appointed by the board. In the initial setup, the president was appointed by, or if you want to call it elected, by just a seven-member board. So he only had to be re responsive to those seven member members of the board, and he didn't have to be responsive to the, to the common members or uh, common members who are the life and, and, and blood of the organization. So we wanted that the president has to be, be, be responsive to, to all the members directly. As the MCC grew internally, it also began broadening its horizons outwards. During the mid to late 70s, the MCC hosted two major conferences, both which were held at the Illinois Institute of Technology. The first was the Hadith Conference in 1975, which was organized in association with the MSA, while the second was the National Conference on Community Development, which took place in 1978 and was organized in cooperation with King Abdulaziz University of Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Well, the Hadith Conference was very important because for the first time it took place in the United States. Secondly, we brought people from all over the world who took part in it, and it gives MCC a great name because people from all over the world realize there is an organization who is doing a good job for the Muslim in this country. Well, the objective was uh, to highlight the contributions made by Mahadisin. Uh, they devoted their lives uh, in compiling the Hadith. And uh, second of our objective was to bring hadith into our lives. Because as you know, Islam has two parts, Quran and hadith, or Sunnah of Rasulullah. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at it, National Con Community Development Conference is very important because we brought people from all over America, Muslims, all kind of people, all shades of people. And they gave us feeding, feedback, what we need, what is necessary, for example, the schools, other organizations, the structure of organizations, and so on and so forth. So we learned from each other, and that was the beginning of cooperation among other uh, Muslim organizations in the United States and MCC. As membership grew through the 70s, the MCC leadership realized that the Kedzie building would not be able to serve the community within a few years. For example, by 1977, the MCC Sunday School at Kedzie had already gone past its full capacity of 180 students. As a result of the tremendous growth, the MCC formed the Masjid and Community Development Project, which was a comprehensive study and all-out effort to establish an entire Muslim community within the northern Chicago area. Site surveys and extensive census studies were done to determine where the Muslim community of Chicago was most densely populated. Architectural drawings for what the proposed masjid and community should look like were commissioned. In addition, fundraising efforts took place and the MCC embarked on an extensive search to find the required 10-acre piece of land upon which to build the masjid complex within the designated northern Chicago area. That was the theme of the year, that we are to develop a community. As compared to you build a mosque, you go and pray, and go home. So it was, uh, uh, in a physical sense, a model of a campus. We have masjid, we have schools, we have social welfare services, we have other services, a lot of people involved building the whole community. While building the masjid complex remained a priority, the immediate matter of needing a new building to facilitate the growing community remained. Unable to secure a piece of land in the designated area, the MCC looked for an existing building. Many properties were examined, and finally, in 1979, the MCC contracted for the purchase of a building located at 5000 North Pulaski. The MCC felt this was a great piece of property. Unfortunately, the agreement fell through, due to opposition by the local community. That, that, that was, uh, I think, around 1979, and that was the Iranian hostage crisis was going on, and still the hostages were, were held up in Iran. So there were general sentiments against Muslims. The, the local community did not know us as to what type of people we were. So they were very uh, afraid of the unknown. And it was a shortcoming or on, on our part that we did not make us known to them as to what we were. Much of the community development work and search for a new masjid was done under the presidency of the late Muhammad Nur al-Din, who was a leader, scholar, and father figure to many of the younger community leaders. 
Brother Noor al Din, as you know, he was an Egyptian brother, and he was a president of MCC. Uh, he was a father figure for us. He also served MCC as a board member, and he was a very ardent supporter of MCC. As a human being, I think he was a very fine human being and a very good Muslim. In 1981, the MCC successfully secured a building on 4380 North Elston Avenue, basically in the same neighborhood as the building on Pulaski. Having learned from their mistakes of the past, the MCC took on a new approach in the manner they introduced themselves to the local community. When we um, signed a contract for the Elston building, obviously by then we had become wiser, going through the experience of uh, rejection of the, the previous building. So we were very cautious and we established a relationship with the local civic organizations. We it took initiatives and met with these people, met with the church groups, met with the, the local commander uh, of the police uh, station there. And they found out that we were very highly educated, very responsible and very morally conscious uh, community. And, and they realized that we will be a, a, an asset to the, uh, the neighborhood. The Elston Building, previously a banquet hall, was purchased for $600,000. The MCC had already raised $193,000, and an additional $200,000, which had been previously committed to the MCC by Rabita al-Islami, arrived shortly thereafter. The community was determined to pay off the building as quickly as possible, and as a result embarked on an all-out fundraising effort that was headquartered in the basement of Brother Azmatullah Qadri. Uh, when we bought the Elston Building, uh, there was a lot of excitement. Everybody was happy that we got a building which we liked it. Uh, so what we decided to have a fundraising office in our basement. And there was a group of 10 or 15 dedicated brothers led by Dr. Akhtar Hussain who were responsible to raise the fund. And every evening those brothers were coming and spending a lot of hours at night, calling the people, visiting it, mass mailing it. They have developed a systematic system. And the result, we saw it, we could able to raise $400,000 in a few months and we paid cash to buy that building. It was a community effort. Everybody joined together to raise this fund. The Elston building was roughly four times the size of the Kedzie building. It was an unbelievable place that captured the hearts and imagination of the community. When I first entered into uh, Elston building, uh, that was amazing. It was a very nice, huge building, and that's what we were looking for. But, as you said about prayer hall, at the time there was no prayer hall. That, uh, there's a big hall, and that hall, uh, I think they were using for banquet purposes. Uh, but as soon as uh, we saw that, we decided that, I mean, in our mind, that this would be our place for prayers, eventually the masjid, you know. One of the reasons the MCC was able to purchase both the Kedzie building and the Elston building at such reasonable prices was a result of the negotiating skills of the late Brother Ali Yusuf. While the community had skillful doctors, engineers, and professors who knew how to build the structure of a community, Ali Yusuf was the one with the real estate knowledge and business acumen that allowed the community to purchase outstanding facilities at an affordable cost. Ali Yusuf was a self-made person, and, and he was uh, a, a tremendously knowledgeable in real estate. So when we were in the process of acquiring this MCC building on Elston Avenue, we uh, sought um, his expertise. The building was in the market for $1.2 million. And uh, then it came down to about 800000 uh, And he was uh, responsible uh, to bring this building for, I think, almost about $600,000. And we, it, he brought it within our grasp with his skillful uh, negotiation. So it was a major contribution of uh, Ali Yusuf that we have this building. As was the case when the Kedzie building was purchased, once Muslims in Chicago realized a larger building on the north side was bought, the community expanded greatly. MCC paid membership rose from 300 in 1978 to 800 by 1983. Additionally, in Elston's first year, over 250 students were enrolled in the Sunday school, up from 160 the year before. With the new building located closer to so many Muslim homes on the north side of Chicago, 
the MCC established a weeknight Darulum in 1982, which was run by Molana Abdullah Salim. Uh, we realized that at that time that this weekend school is not sufficient enough for the education of the children. So the idea was with this uh, Darul Ulum that the children from the neighborhood will come after they come home from the regular school, they come here and they really learn how to read Quran. This is school is four days a week from Monday to Thursday. We have an adult program. We teach them Arabic language. We have also Tajweed class, that's once a week, and we try to teach the children as well as the youth and uh, adult people to learn Quran so, and uh, read Quran correctly. As the Muslim community grew in size, the children of the Kedzi Mosque were now high school and college age students. As a result, the MCC placed a heavy emphasis on youth activities during the 80s. The MCC has placed the importance on the youth activities in the past several years is based on the realizations that our youth are the future leaders of this country and as well as the Muslim community Ummah. These young Muslims formed a very strong and vibrant youth group in the 80s. The Islamic education they received as well as the social peer group they found in the MCC went a long way in helping them define their identity as young first-generation American Muslims. I think it was a big part of uh, gaining a good self-esteem was being around these people who were just like me, who understood where I was coming from when I would say something or talk about home or, or talk about what we felt at school. The biggest event the Muslim Youth Committee would organize each year were the Muslim Youth Camps. These camps were well attended by over a hundred youth who would gather for a week of Islamic education and recreational activities. It gave the young people a chance to live as a, uh, in an Islamic environment for a period of one week where they weren't pressured by homework, by work around the house, by their parents, but rather were with their peers and it gave them an opportunity to practice their Islam, to pray five times a day, which some of them were not used to doing. It also gave them some Islamic education on topics that were pertinent to them, about pressures they were having in school, about um, pressures in society, about things they wanted to know, things that they were concerned about. The youth camps I saw really as a, as a place to get away from the uh, worldly life of the, the 51 weeks of the year and you get into a more of an atmosphere where there's where there's Muslims all around you you're in you're in kind of a mini Muslim community a lot of the tafsirs or khutbas that we had helped us to associate Islam into daily life and we were able to be with a whole bunch of Muslim sisters at the same time well for the Muslim women it was a chance for us to get together and actually be able to participate in activities uh, with a lot more freedom than we would have if we were, we didn't have the camp. I mean, we were able to go, um, you know, do riflery and, you know, the swimming and canoeing, all the activities that would, and we were segregated, but we were able to do it in our, with a lot of freedom and we had a lot of fun. For the older Muslim youth, the camps also gave them the opportunity to fully organize the event as well as provide insight and guidance to the younger youth. I think one of the things that uh, the kids of the younger generation benefited from many of the older kids being counselors uh, at, at the camps was that I think they could learn from us about from, from our experiences in, in the world and in college and how to be a young Muslim and be comfortable as a young Muslim um, without feeling, uh, you know, as, as though you're someone else. We always let them know that it was that we were always available and um, that no matter what, you know, they could always talk to us, get advice from us, um, and just feel comfortable. Perhaps most importantly, the youth groups and camps created everlasting bonds of friendship among those who attended. The friends that I made at that time, I consider those people to be still my best friends, even if we don't see each other a lot. I mean, whenever I see them, I'm extremely happy and. It, it was an environment where we, had, where we seemed to have a center, and everybody who did things, they, were, they seemed to be committed to whatever they were doing. And um, 
it, it gave a sense of purpose to our lives. When the MCC moved from Kedzie to Elston, it came into an area which had a large number of Arab Muslims living in the surrounding neighborhood. Most of these Arabs went to the Masjid Aliman, located at 3518 West Montrose. Leaders of both the MCC and Masjid Aliman got together and decided to integrate both communities. As a result, in 1988, the leaders of Masjid Aliman transferred their members, Arabic school, personal knowledge, and financial resources to the MCC. This integration of the two communities helped realize a vision the founding members had pursued 20 years earlier. From the very beginning, the members of the Arab community have been supportive and have participated in the activities of the MCC. They, have, they were, the, from the very beginning, the, they served in the boards, the executive committee. I remember some of the brothers, they have worked as a treasurer of MCC. And one brother was uh, even the president of MCC. But indeed, in the beginning, the number were small. But in the mid-'80s, we found that a large number of the people they started to come to MCC. Indeed, in the beginning, the number were small. But in the mid-'80s, we found that a large number of the people they started to come to MCC. Now we have a large number of the members of the Arab community come to MCC. Uh, on the Friday, I can say that majority of them are from the Arab community. They run a school here under the MCC uh, for the children of the Arab community on Saturday. And all the increased activity and the fast and the feast during the month Ramadan is because of them. And really, they have contributed and strengthened the MCC very much. And inshallah, I hope that they will continue to strengthen MCC. The new generation, generations, they are all growing in America. There is no barriers in between, there is no boundaries, and so on. And we should remove such boundaries by bringing them, them all together in one school, Islamic schools, and so on. It, no difference between whether you uh, came from Pakistan or Arabia and so on, but you are under the umbrella of Islam at one school for one goal, one uh, uh, purpose, that is to be a good Muslim. In the late 80s, the MCC at Elston was running at full capacity. The weekend school alone was attended by over 750 students. At that time, in an effort to further enhance the educational levels of all Muslims, the MCC created the Islamic Education Program Development Committee, whose purpose was to develop a total educational system for people of all ages, young and old alike. The second generation has to be ready to take over, and a certain time has to pass before they become ready. Uh, therefore, my emphasis was that uh, we should start working for education at all levels. The ultimate goal is that every child in every Muslim home gets education in the, in the total sense. With various models of education being developed and the Elston building under full use, MCC leadership began making plans to find an additional facility to serve as both an educational and recreational center for the community. In searching for this facility, the MCC made it clear that its intention was to focus on an educational and recreational center rather than on construction of a mosque. The Board of Directors approved the bidding for initially the Kenton School and later the Fairview School, both which were located in the northwest suburb of Skokie. However, both bids ultimately were lost. We chose our priority to build human beings. So it is not the uh, stone structure that carries through centuries, but it is human beings. It is human beings who carry the mission, not the structure. A structure to serve human beings. The MCC found that the Borg School, a spacious and modern facility in Morton Grove, was going to be auctioned for sale. A vote was put to the general body to decide whether or not to pursue the building. The general body decided against it. The vote turned out the way it did for a variety of reasons. However, the main reason the community decided against bidding for Borg was they feared the bidding could go as high as $3 million, as had previously happened with the Kenton School. Although the general body had given up on the pursuit of the Borg School, the Muslim management group, MMG, felt certain that this was an opportunity not to be missed. 
And what happened is this, after everybody went home thinking that we are not going to go and bathe, a couple of brothers got ready, they called and we got together, decided at one o'clock in the morning that we will go there and collect $100,000 and we bid that because we, this, uh, this is the investment that we need to make and if we lose this particular chance now, we will not get it ever. On September 1st, 1989, MMG was able to secure the Borg building through an auction for only $1.825 million, approximately half of what the community believed its sale price would be. It was MMG's intention to buy the building and then turn around and sell it to the MCC at the same price. Once they won the bid, MMG placed $100,000 down on the building. However, they still needed to raise an additional $400,000 to pay the remaining deposit, which was due immediately after Labor Day weekend. The pressure was building on MMG to muster up support from the community. If ever there was a time for the Muslims of Chicago to rally together, it was now. We got back and we talked to the community people that this is what we had to pay for this such a beautiful building. Nobody could believe it. They were overjoyed. Different people were using different phones, started, you know, calling their friends and telling them, we need this school for the community, for our children, our future. Everybody, alhamdulillah, responded very well. When we brought 60 different checks, totaling $400,000, general superintendent of the school district, Dr. John Graham, he kind of wondered what he was saying. He couldn't believe it. But he did say this, I don't know whether I believe in my own God or not, but I definitely st have started believing in your God. The surprise at, that uh, we had at the way in which money was collected uh, certainly gave evidence of uh, the solidity of the community and uh, the group itself and the commitment of the members to their organization and I guess I made a few jokes about I wish that uh, Christians knew how to raise money <laughs> in this fashion. We don't do it nearly as well. Soon after, the MCC general body voted again on whether or not to purchase the Borg School. This time they approved the purchase and gained rights to the building from MMG. Once the community agreed to purchase the building, they faced the arduous task of raising the remaining $1.325 million within 30 days. The fundraising drive would have to bring in more than three times the amount of money that was raised when the Elston building was purchased nearly a decade earlier. The community left no stone unturned in attempting to beat the deadline, when suddenly unexpected opposition by Morton Grove residents brought the transaction to a standstill. The residents' opposition supposedly was due to their desire to keep the land for the town's public use. However, the Muslim community could not help but think otherwise. I think the underlying uh, thing was really the fear of the unknown, that when they found out the Muslim community was buying the building, they got concerned. They did not know the Muslim community well enough. They got concerned that some outside source, some foreign source, some alien community is coming in and establishing their center in the midst of where they live. Well, let, let's be, be honest. Um, people heard the word Muslim. They didn't know what that meant. There was a rumor going around at the time that it was black Muslims uh, affiliated with Louis Farrakhan, and there was a fear of that. And uh, the school board members themselves, at the time of the, the, um, the later votes, uh, when they were defeated shortly thereafter, um, said they got a lot of phone calls from people, uh, you know, saying, why did you sell the school to these people? Those residents who opposed the sale of the school to the MCC quickly formed a coalition called Save the Borg Foundation. The citizens then voiced their disapproval of the transaction by voting in five write-in candidates to the Board of Education in the November 1989 election. Meanwhile, the MCC scrambled to raise funds for the Education Center. However, the due date for the balance was continually delayed due to the controversy in the Morton Grove community. Ironically, the opposition ended up helping the Muslims' cause more than hindering it, extending the due date of full payment from 30 to 90 days. What was working against us, which was the local Morton Grove community's opposition to our purchase of the building, ended up working for us because that opposition of the community kept delaying the date of closing for us. 
and we were quite happy to let them delay the process because we were getting more time to collect the money. The added time allowed ISNA, through their North American Islamic Trust, to step in and show their unconditional support of the MCC. Sheikh Ahmad Zaki Hamad, the ISNA president and former MCC vice president, paved the way for a $600,000 interest-free loan to the MCC. We got almost $600,000 from one particular organization, and I would like to commend them. Without their help, without their support, probably we would not have made this deal complete in time. And that was NAID, North American Islamic Trust. Over the course of the next year, the MCC moved into the building and established a preschool, kindergarten, first and second grade. Meanwhile, District 70 Board of Education attempted a number of unsuccessful maneuvers to reclaim the building. The battle began to divide the citizens of Morton Grove. Many residents who got to know the Muslims on a personal basis established an organization called Citizens Advocating Responsible Education, CARE. CARE felt the Muslims deserved the building, and did not want to see their tax dollars spent on a long and cumbersome legal battle with the MCC. The issue came down to two referendums placed on the November 6, 1990 ballot, which let the residents voice their opinion as to whether or not they wanted the school board to continue its fight to reclaim the building. On election day, the residents of Morton Grove voted three to one in favor of the MCC, in a landslide victory that gave the Muslims of Chicago the respect and recognition they rightfully deserved. Yeah, when the citizens of Morton Grove voted in favor of us, it was a thrill, it was a joy. On top of it, we were thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it was His mercy. Once I still remember the first day when we prayed in MEC, together we all were in tears. They learned that uh, the unknown is not so fearful after all, that uh, sometimes it does work out. And I, I believe that um, they have found the school to be a very good neighbor. It says quite a bit about the Morton Grove community as well, um, that Initially, they may have been uh, afraid or fearful of what they were getting into, but when they realized that, no, this is a fair transaction and the Muslim community has a right to establish their school as anybody else would, they realized that they cannot be unfair. So it says a lot about the Morton Grove community as well, that they went to the side of fairness. Today, the MEC facility has been paid in full. More importantly, the facility is being used seven days a week for a number of activities, ranging from daily prayers and adult education sessions to recreational activities such as Friday night basketball and the annual MEC Food and Fun Fair. Friday night basketball has proven to be an extremely popular activity for the Muslim youth of Chicago, sometimes drawing up to 50 participants in an evening. The Muslims are not immune from all the problems of this society. It's a good place, especially on a Friday night, where you could go to a party, you could go to a dance, but now you could go to MEC. A food fair gives an opportunity for all the Muslims in our community to come together in a more relaxing atmosphere. Our community looks forward to this food fair. The biggest achievement of the MEC is that it houses the MCC full-time school. The school, which began four short years ago, is already at full capacity with 180 students ranging from preschool to eighth grade. The noteworthy thing about the MCC full-time school is that it allows children to receive an education which integrates Islam into their daily school activities. Our community members realize that we must try to provide a, an optimum environment for the education of our children. Of course, our children receive their education, their religious education, as well as other education at home but they can also receive other uh, religious aspects uh, over a period of time during the day as well if they were to go to a school where they offer a program of Islamic education. I think it's very important to have a full-time Islamic school because I think the children really learn to live Islam. Here they see they have role models here also. They see it and they do it and they practice. They practice what they learn. I mean, we stop for Zohar Salat. We stop for Asar Salat. On top of all of that, we are striving to give them the very best academic education in science, social studies, reading, math, language arts, everything. In addition, the MCC full-time school has provided students with the opportunity to participate in a number of extracurricular activities, including basketball, 
Boy Scouts, science fairs, as well as involvement in musical performances. Most importantly, the MCC full-time school has provided students an opportunity to learn in an environment which they truly appreciate and enjoy. I like coming to a full-time Islamic school because we learn more about Islam in one week than rather going to Sunday school for one day in a week. I like to come to a full-time Islamic school because it teaches me Islam. I can learn more surahs on the Quran. I learn how to pray and do my wudu. I like to come to school because it's a lot of fun and we can learn lots of things. I like to try and go to because it was Muslim school. I learned in school how to spell things um, and to add, and we learn our religion, Islam, and we uh, read the Quran, and um, we do fun things. For the past 25 years, the MCC has meant a lot of things to a lot of people. For the youth, it has been a place which has given them the opportunity to forge friendships and increase their Islamic knowledge. I like coming to Sunday school because there are friends who understand me. I like Sunday school because I want, I want to learn how to be a true Muslim. I like Sunday school because we learn about Prophet Muhammad and his life. I like Sunday school because we learn about Islam. You gain more Islamic knowledge, so when you discuss stuff with people who are not Muslim, you have more knowledge, you can hold up a better discussion, and you're more prepared, and you learn more about Islam and your religion, and um, you get to make more friendships with other Muslim people, which is usually not possible during the week. MCC is a place where we can learn all about Islamic values. In, t in today's society, values are being lost, and we need to have a place where we can come to learn Islam. For adults, the MCC has been a place where families could get together to educate, socialize, and support one another. Yeah, the, the MCC is important to me because I come here on a regular basis, uh, at least uh, every Sunday for prayer, and also it is a center for Muslims to come here and uh, to show to the community here in Chicago that uh, the Muslims are well and alive. I feel MCC is important to me because I've come here for 10 years of my life and everything I've basically learned about Islamic knowledge has come from MCC and its teachers. I like MCC because in the days of Hazrat Umar, the way of democratic life was already started way, way long back. To me, this is the only organization which runs by democratic way of life. As the MCC looks to its future, three areas of interest seem to present the greatest need. The first of these is the need for a recreational and fitness center to serve the community. The second is the development of a large masjid. And third, and perhaps most importantly, is the mobilization of the youth. Right now, the focus seems to be on the recreational and physical fitness in the community. Give them the opportunity uh, for the people who are getting into the age groups where they need to take care of their health uh, properly. At the same time, give the younger group an opportunity to grow into it. Uh, what the focal point uh, right now is uh, in area of uh, uh, building up of a, a recreational center or a physical fitness center, and that could include uh, both uh, swimming pool and uh, uh, other uh, physical activities, uh, uh, rooms. We really have to have provide our children with opportunities to learn about one another, and that's going to perhaps hap, help happen more likely in a in a recreational setting, and at the same time provide opportunities for some of our aging uh, uh, community members to to get out and actually walk around and exercise those bodies to get them to um, stimulate the muscles as well as the mind. So I think in the area of uh, the athletic uh, facility. We're going to see a challenge there for us to, uh, to try to, uh, to build such a facility, given that, of course, uh, there are going to be contending uh, demands for um, funds for new masjids or bigger masjids. 
Uh, so the high school area, the area of an athletic facility, uh, we're looking to actually build a masjid from ground up uh, in our, perhaps in our Morton Grove area that would accommodate about 800 to 1,000 people uh, because this being a school and the community being formed around it, it's quite natural then that we'd have to make provisions for a masjid in this area. We want to mobilize particularly the youth because the people who contribute in early times, after a few years, perhaps they may not be here. So we want the youth to uh, take the responsibility and shoulder more uh, work with the MCC right now doing in, by involving in various committees. And uh, that way the leadership will be de developed and eventually there will, be, there, there will be our hope for the 21st century. As the MCC celebrates its rich history and examines the triumphs and tribulations of the past 25 years, two things become very clear. First, that no matter how large the community grows and no matter how efficiently it runs, it will always face moments of adversity and challenge. But secondly, and perhaps more importantly, if it addresses those challenges with the same enthusiasm, cohesion, and brotherhood as it has done in the past, its future is destined to be decorated with achievements and accomplishments that are symbolic of the first 25 years.